This week on Arts Insight, Homes of the Heights. When I first started, my biggest challenge was defining a style. A blind artist creates visual masterpieces. And what happens with my work today is that people will start to walk by and then stop. From storage to housing exquisite art. You look at some of my older paintings and you look at the newer ones and you can tell the big difference. And making the happiest place on earth. Yes, if is a language that creative people love. Mm -hmm. And no, because is a language of somebody who doesn't want to make the deal. I'm Ernie Manus, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. We're coming to you today from the Heights, where there's a lot of renovation going on, including the theater behind me. Did you know back in 1929, you could see a silent film at the Heights Theater for just 20 cents a ticket? They've come a long way since then. We're gonna tell you all about the vision for the theater in just a moment. But first, not far from here, an illustrator has an eye on architecture. She's transforming houses in this very neighborhood in her own creative way. Art is a very powerful medium. It provokes curiosity, excitement, sometimes controversy, but it also inspires. I think that's really what it does for me. When I was working for a tech company, I was put in a role that was more strategic versus creative, and I felt like I was kind of losing a bit of that creativity. I needed some sort of outlet outside of my time to make sure that those creative juices are still flowing, so I started this Homes of the Heights project. My name is Dahlia Rahani, and I'm a designer and illustrator. I live in a home in the Heights, and to me it's the most beautiful home. I wanted to draw that for my fiance as a birthday present. After I drew that, I just started falling in love with the idea of doing more of those. When I first started, my biggest challenge was defining a style. I didn't know if I wanted it to be like minimal or an exact recreation or how I wanted to do that. So the first few took me a while of trying to hone in on what my style is going to be. If I see a home that I like, I'll snap a few photos, try to zoom in and get a few more details, and go home and throw that photo on my computer. I'll start looking at the windows and the doors and refer back to other homes that I've done because there are a lot of similarities between homes. I actually have a document on my computer that holds all of the elements from all of the homes that I've done. So I like to pull from there and then customize them and start drawing with these vector tools to build the house. I go piece by piece and it eventually just comes together. The unique part of what I do is that each illustration is totally custom. I try to just look around, see what makes it unique. If they want their dog in there laying on the front porch, I'm gonna put that in there really just paying attention to those close details. I have a few favorite houses that I've illustrated. One of them is your typical craftsman bungalow style house. The homeowner actually didn't know that she was getting this print as a gift. Her boyfriend asked me to draw it and asked me to put her like, beloved dog in the front. Another one of my favorite homes is a Queen Anne Victorian style home. It's purple and lime green and it's kind of wild colors and there's a stained glass detail all over the windows and it's just absolutely gorgeous. My third favorite home, I like it so much because it kind of looks like a cartoon when you just see, it looks like an illustration when you just drive by it and it's bright blue and bright yellow and it's not really a style I've ever seen before. The first 10-15 homes that I designed, um, the homeowners didn't know I was drawing their homes. 
they just happened to be ones that I thought either had cool colors or different details that I wanted to try out illustrating. I'm so honored that people like what I'm doing and that people like them enough to want to put those prints in their homes and show off that part of the homes that make them unique. I think the most enjoyable part of illustrating these homes is meeting all of the new neighbors that I would not have been meeting otherwise. Just talking to them, learning about the history of their homes, that's just been very rewarding and a lot of fun. This project has been very therapeutic for me. Every time I start a new home, I just zone in on the details and just get lost in the house. And a few hours later, the final product is better than what I hoped, and I just really enjoy doing that time and time again. See more at DaliaRahani.com. We're in Northeast Houston at the Historic Heights Theater, which just underwent a major overhaul. It's come a long way since it first opened its doors nearly a century ago. We're gonna find out how. Joining us is theater owner and operator, Edwin Cabanis. Thank you so much for doing this. Ernie, welcome to the Heights Theater. So you picked our little neighborhood to come and put this theater here. Tell me about why you picked this place. It's kind of funny, actually the neighborhood picked me. We actually went around to four other cities and looked in a lot of different places. Houston was always on the short list because of the proximity to Dallas. And it just makes for perfect routing for our artists, our national touring acts and our, our regional touring acts that come through. And once we kind of got into Houston, we started looking at a lot of the different neighborhoods. And the first time I drove on 19th Street and I saw the old historic buildings and the Heights Theater was there and it was open. What fascinates me is this theater has been here for a very long time. Sure. It sat empty for a long time. It's had different uses. No one took the time to do what you did. Why? It's not easy. It's, <laughs> it's very expensive to do historic preservations. But like anything, everybody says location, location, location on real estate, but there's an overlay to that and it's timing, timing, timing. Yeah. So we feel like that things are really good inside. We wanted to be inside of an urban area, inside of the loop as it were uh, here in Houston. So we could not be more pleased that we found this at the time we did. So what can people come to expect here at the Heights Theater? Now? We're going to have to earn it and we understand that and we're going to take a little bit of time. Right now we're in our kind of what I would call our early startup phase, kind of, uh, you know, kind of our soft opening. I suspect by the time we hit about March, people will start to understand what we're about. We've already tipped our hand a little bit by if you walk in and look at the design, you can see that we specifically separate our bar area from our listening room environment, if you will. But when you walk through the doors, the door shuts behind you, then you walk through another set of doors, then you're in the environment, you're in the listening environment. And for us specifically, it's nothing is more important than that artist patron experience. And so I think over time people will come to understand that we're real serious about our art here. And speaking of your art, you do have a revolving art exhibit in here. Explain a little about that. So we have a gallery space. A lot of people say, well, isn't that kind of uh, preying on a public that doesn't know they're coming to an art opening? Well, yeah, you know, but we push, you know. <laughs> sneak we'll it in there. Sneak it in there. Um, the best way to describe our art is probably folk art in frames. Uh, what we've noticed, we've done several exhibits. Most of our exhibits sell out. Um, they run for about six weeks. We try to showcase some of our, our local artists, uh, not only on the stage, but also on our walls. And Houston it's got a great, great art community. Okay, quickly give me an idea of some of the artists that may be performing on this stage. Well, we're very excited. So to kind of give you a range of artists that you probably have heard of, Trudy Lynn. She's been around playing the blues scene and we're very excited to have her coming in. Another young man that you might not have heard of that's a really a, kind of a new soul, old school R&B is a guy named Eric Lindell. But on a, any given night, for those that really want to hear meticulous singer-songwriter, Justin Hayward of the Moody Blues is coming. And the next night, can get a little rowdy in here is we've got the great band out of East LA and that's Los Lobos. So you can expect a little bit of everything with us. Well, I guess the important thing is just make sure you walk in here. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you so much for helping us do that. Thank you so much and, and the place looks great. Thank you, Ernie. Congratulations. To find out more, visit theheightstheater.com. Okay, now an artist in Colorado had been honing his craft for over three decades when a stroke took his sight. Since then, his life has become one of rediscovery. Art can be done quickly and look brilliant. My work can't be done that way. The work that I do does require patience because 
one wrong line, one wrong dot, one misplaced scratch, and it's ruined. I paint portraits on monofilament line. Each layer I paint in a shade slightly different from the layer in front so that it grabs the eye and pulls it down and through all eight layers. And when you look at it, no matter where you stand, the painting always gives you a different perspective back. And what happens with my work today is that people will start to walk by and then stop. And they back up and they look and they go, what? And they come around to the side, they look through the side. And when people look at them, sometimes they ask me if they're holograms. No, they're paintings. It's a painting. But I want to engage people. I want people to be interactive with the art. I've been working with my dad to get into bigger shows that he probably wouldn't normally put himself into. I really kind of just have to tell him what it is because if I say a monofilament painting, of course the answer is, well, what is that? And so I just have to tell him it's 129 strands across, eight layers deep of hand-painted fishing line. And as soon as I get to the fishing line, they're like, well, wait a minute, start that over? <laughs> Once his art has been accepted on its own merit, then I will tell him, oh yeah, my father's the artist, he's right over here. And they're like, wow, he's blind too? I was shot in the head in Vietnam in 1970, and it left bullet fragments in my head. And uh, in 1993, I was teaching, I was a professor at the University of Colorado, and the bullet fragment in my head moved and caused a stroke in my visual cortex and I woke up at the hospital and the surgeon looked at me and said, you're blind. My vision is pin dots just straight ahead and I was angry for a very long time after I lost my eyesight and my two youngest daughters uh, came to me and said, Dad, you've always loved art, why don't you get back to it? In the beginning it was encouragement to say that, you know, your life isn't over. Obviously, you still have something to give back. You can relearn to see, relearn to pour your own coffee, relearn to do your art. I spent two frustrating years learning how to do my art again without the eyesight that an artist truly needs, but I figured it out. I switch back and forth now between five different lenses while I'm working, and my art eventually got me so busy I forgot to be angry. And my problem is I enjoy too many types of art. He's taken that leap, done so well, and then broken through those boundaries to create something new. He started by doing the VA and a lot of smaller shows, a lot of things that are disability oriented, but I felt like his work was getting much better and deserved a broader audience. And so I wanted him to start getting into more events around town. I see an empty space and I paint in the way that I see. So you're actually looking through empty space to see the image. All the art hangs freely in space on the strands. So that exploration of empty space is what led me from the monofilament to the abstract linears that I'm doing now because it's a continuation of that exploration of empty space. They look at my abstracts and they realize there's the painting in front, but there's no shading. And then they realize that all the shading comes from the abstract design in the back. And it engages people. And to me, art should engage. I think art is something that speaks to everybody on such a different level. It gives everybody such a different perspective to themselves, to the world, to the world they personally live in, I think art can heal. It made me overcome my anger. It gave me purpose. And I get discouraged, I get frustrated. I look up and there's that sentence. And I wrote that for myself. A man with a vision is never truly blind. You can follow his work on Facebook at Artist Jim Stevens. Now, when a Florida artist needed a new studio, his family decided to transform an old storage space into the Pink House Gallery.
This came about because uh, my father was looking for a uh, new studio space. Um, he was having to move out of his previous space at Art South in Homestead, but it was my husband's idea, actually. He was using uh, this room in particular for storage for his business. And he, when he presented the idea, we were, it was a very daunting task because of the condition that the property was in. The house was in very, very poor condition. He was really, really in bad shape. And he said, my son-in-law says, well, can you use this for a studio? And I walk in and I thought to myself, no, I can't. <laughs> but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say that to him, you know, he's a super guy. He's, I say, sure, I can, we can fix it. And my daughter says, yeah, I help you. I learned so much. Um, I learned how to use a nail gun, which was really cool. And I learned how to drywall and how to mud the walls and um, a bunch of other stuff. So it was really exciting um, and very satisfying to, to turn the space over and to make it kind of a sweet space. We talking one day and when I was looking at the place well, to see whether we could do something with it. And I just had an idea. I said, Susie, why don't you just, uh, you be the gallery owner and director and I'll be the uh, artist in residence and we will have, you know, we can have all their artists in here as well and this is what we want to do. Dad's got a great space to work in, great space to hang in, but we also have the idea that we want to have other artists come in and we just, I just feel like it's a, it's kind of a blank slate, you know, as a, as a gallery and, I, you know, there's other possibilities of things that I want to do, um, like I would like to have a sculpture garden. Um, outside, we have a beautiful stand of trees of very mature mahoganies, and um, so I feel like that, you know, and that's another project that'll take time and, you know, the, the artistic eye. And Dad knows a lot of artists from Art South, uh, so many talented people, uh, also locally here. There are just so many amazing artists. So we're just really open. I'm very open to that sort of creativity and just the different possibilities of what we can do here. first painting I did, I thought it was great. After a couple of years, I, dis I destroyed it because that it was ugly. But I, at first I thought it was great and that got me into, hey, let me learn how to do this. So I learned on my own. I started visiting galleries and museums and uh, things like that and reading books. So I learned how to paint. And again, it's progressive. You look at some of my older paintings and you look at the newer ones and you can tell the big difference. It was kind of a surprise for us all when Dad started painting. I remember when he went back to school. He was probably in his 50s. Um, I was still in school myself. Um, it was just like, wow, he can do that, you know? So, and he just kind of took off with it and the talent was there. It just just needed a space, you know, needed that creative outlet. Uh, I like to show a lot of sky. The sky is amazing, you can paint and I, those I paint from memory, and I, I can, for instance, I see it, I see something that I want to paint, I take photos of it, I make a quick sketch in my uh, sketchbook, and when I get to the studio, I try to paint from memory, what I remember, so the skies is something that, even in the photograph shows the sky one way, I can paint it in a different way, different light. I can, I have the ability, and this I learned from mechanical drawing when I was an engineer. A view, and I can, I have the ability to move, to change the angle, just by looking at that print and sketch my own. So I, I change, I change things. It's relaxing, you feel creative, and that gives you some satisfaction. Uh, now, sometimes, there, sometimes there are days that go by and you're totally dry and empty, okay? It happens quite often. But all of a sudden, it's like a eureka moment, you know? You get some inspiration, something that you go, jump on that canvas and you start painting, and you feel so good. Um, I don't know how to describe it. It's, ask any artist the same questions. You see, they won't be able to answer it uh, in a way that everybody can understand, but it's, it comes from inside. It's, it's like having, you know, forget about tranquilizers and all that garbage that people take to feel good. And, no, paint or do some kind of art, that'll do it. 
I admire him, you know, for, for going back to school, for pursuing, you know, this thing that started out as a hobby and then became, you know, a great uh, career. And like I said, involved all of us, you know, and has sort of just sucked us all in and has uh, created a love for art and for the environment. You can find out more by visiting pinkhouseart.com. And finally tonight, Disneyland is a place of adventure for children and adults alike. Uh, there was a man who worked alongside Walt Disney himself, and he gives us an inside glimpse into the making of this iconic park. Disneyland, building the happiest place on earth, took a lot of optimism to say the least. And Marty Sklar knows this firsthand, having been part of it all, and now tells it all. Well, not all. There were two things about it. One was I had a story to tell about my experiences at Disney, and that led to leadership and how to deal with people to, to create things like this tiki room. Uh, and the second was, it, in a sense, it's a business book because it's about the growth of this park business. Uh, because when I started, there was just this place, and we hadn't done Walt Disney World yet. And so uh, it's about all the ways that we organized to accomplish that around the world now. Creating a new world of entertainment on a cornerstone of Once Upon a Time. That first summer, uh, I used to go out to the ticket windows and, and uh, listen to what people were asking. And they'd say, I want to go on the Jungle Cruise, and I want to go on the Mark Twain Riverboat, and I want to go on the Flight to the Moon, but I don't want to go on any of the rides. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, what are they talking about? And rides were what happened in the old amusement parks, the shoot the shoots and the whips and all those kind of things. And what Walt was doing here for the first time in this kind of environment was telling stories. And that's what this place is about, telling stories in a very different way, in a three-dimensional way. Surrounding himself with characters who could or would make it happen. The one thing about that with Walt is he never asked how old you were. He never asked what your experience was. He just wanted to know what you could do. And once you've been tested in the fire, uh, and for me, it was a huge growth experience because think about all those Disney legends who were my mentors, John Hench and Mark Davis and, and Roly Crump and, and on and on. I, mean, I could name you 30 Disney legends. And I was the kid. <laughs> When I started, uh, when, when Walt brought me from Disneyland, I was in publicity, to uh, WED, WED Enterprises, now Walt Disney Imagineering, in uh, 1961 to work on the New York World's Fair shows. I also worked on this show and uh, wrote a few lines. Wally Bogue wrote the whole show, but I have a few lines in there. But I wrote all the stuff that's out here in the garden and I worked with some wonderful talent. Thurl Ravenscroft, who did the big voice of the gods, and Ginny Tyler, who was on the Mickey Mouse Club, and she could do any voice you wanted and does the voice of a couple of the, the gods that we have in here. So this was my, my first gig, if you will, in, in doing a show in the Disney Park. Late in the 90s, we uh, went in here and, and refurbished the whole thing. And uh, the birds and uh, new feathers <laughs> and uh, the whole, uh, shortened the show. It was originally 17 minutes and now it's 14 or something like that. And one amazing thing about this, if you go in to the, the, the theater part where the people sit, and imagine that backstage there was an, another room that had all the equipment that ran this show in 1963. And now you could run this, I'll take this out of my pocket here, you could run this whole show from this. Right. And we've got a room back there that's still <laughs> bigger than the theater. 
that had all the equipment that ran in 1963. To turn dreams into reality meant never saying never. Well, Buzz Price, who picked this location for Disneyland, used to say to that he, he, you couldn't say no to Walt, we all knew that. And Buzz developed a language, yes if. And the yes if was, if you think about this and in include this, maybe it'll work. And then for somebody who was willing, as Walt was, to take a chance and to make the risk, that would, it was potentially something that would work. And I think that's great advice because when you say no to somebody, you, that just turns everything off. And Buzz's point was, yes, if is a language that creative people love. Mm -hmm. And no, because is a language of somebody who doesn't want to make the deal. And we always wanted to make the deal here. Yeah. It's the attitude that, uh, and, and the opportunity we had that this was all new and nobody could tell you will say to you, well, that won't work. How do you know? So we tried it. And some of it worked, some of it didn't. And that's why when I said earlier that failure is part of the opportunity of creating new things, we did fail on certain things. But we, we learned from that, too. And the next time, we, we did it better. For more details on the park, go to Disneyland.DisneyGo. Com. From the Heights Theater in the Houston Heights, that's a wrap on this edition of Arts Insight. For all of us here at Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching and have a great week.